should Rahul Gandhi readily accept the position of leader of the opposition, LOP? Welcome, good morning and good wishes to all. I address this question because uh, several of my friends, my brothers and sisters who keep company with me on uh, a temple of thoughts express their uh, concern and some of them their disappointment the Rahul is still dragging his feet in accepting the responsibility to serve the country as the LOP, or Leader of Opposition. Now, what are we to think of this? In what light do we see this? There are at least two completely different perspectives possible on this. The first possibility is that uh, this is yet another sign of Rahul's perennial streak in character. Namely, that he is unwilling to take on responsibilities. He likes to be a freewheeling politician who wants to be footloose and fancy free and not be tied down to a a particular responsibility about which would circumscribe his personal liberties and make him accountable and burden him with responsibilities, perhaps responsibilities for which he is not altogether ready. So he wants to have the best of it, uh, the best of the two poss uh, of both possibilities. Uh, he wants to play it both ways. That's certainly one perspective and in support of this may be cited the readiness with which uh, Rahul Gandhi resigned from the office of the President of the International Con 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 Conference in the wake of the 2019 general election debacle. I too felt disappointed at that time and I remember writing an article carried by the New Indian Express where I stated emphatically that for Rahul to demit office at this time when the party as a whole is in a state of low morale would be actually for the Congress party to commit harakiri. That's exactly the word I used. And uh, this um, article elicited several responses. This article was also translated into some of the regional languages and I remember seeing the Malayalam version of it at that time. So, um, in that article I also pointed out that it is during a time of crisis or a time of uh, low morale that the metal of a leader needs to be proved and it's the duty of the leader to impart uh, a new uh, uh, spell of confidence and uh, he uh, hope to the ranks, uh, to the cadre. However, uh, Rahul demitted office and the rest of it, uh, rest of the story you know, I don't have to go into those details. So this could be the background in which, in which the suspicion uh, begins to worry people, well-meaning people, absolutely well-meaning people, I wouldn't have otherwise taken up this point for discussion. However, there is another perspective and that's perhaps something I want you to consider. I'm not saying that this is the case. I'm in no position to assert dogmatically that this is the real uh, uh, grain of the matter. And what is that uh, alternative interpretation? Um, you know, there are two types of people in this world. One is those who are quick to leap into positions of importance, who think that uh, th their, their personal worth must be calibrated on the size and scale of the chairs they occupy. They're also attracted by positions because of the opportunities and the empowerment these positions afford them in order to make a quick buck. As a rule, I agree with Plato, who argues in his classic work, Republic, 
Now those who are quick to seize opportunities or, or those who are jockeying for power and those who covet offices, do not do so out of good intentions. And you can check on this. Plato, the Greek philosopher, is emphatic in stating that if you happen to see anybody who is keen either to gain power or hold on to power, rest assured that person is not animated by benign motives. This is a point of view that's at least 2,400 years old. And I have not seen this point of, point of view refuted by any major thinker since then. That's the reason why I align myself uh, to this line of thought. I'm also inclined to think of it this way. Now, uh, the story may not and need not end there. It is obvious that many in the India coalition, certainly uh, almost everyone in the Congress ranks, want, uh, wants Rahul to take on this responsibility. Uh, but in spite of that, uh, why does he still drag his feet? Now here, let me bang a little on my background as a student of literature, if not as a teacher of uh, English literature. In particular, uh, let me draw from Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare has two, uh, two uh, it's a set of four major tragedies, but out of them I'm going to pick two. Two celebrated tragedies. One is Macbeth and the other is Hamlet. Hamlet was written before Macbeth was written. Now these two uh, dramas, these two plays are a study in contrast. In Hamlet, you have a protagonist, the central character, whose name is Hamlet. The text draws its name from the main character, Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark. Now, the problem with Hamlet is that he has the background of the University of Wittenberg. Hamlet was a scholar, a thinker, a, a particularly sensitive soul, someone who weighs the pros and cons, perhaps a little longer and a little more than is actually desired or is practical. And therefore, he finds it difficult to come to an immediate decision. Therefore, you have this celebrated soliloquy, to be or not to be, that's a question. To be or not to be, that's a question. Should I do this? Should I not do it? Should Or push the question to the furthest possible reach. Should I live or should I not live? Should I commit suicide or should I not commit suicide? So Hamlet is often caught in this wretched state of indecision. So in that sense, uh, the play Hamlet has been traditionally interpreted as the tragedy of human indecision, which is uh, a universal feature of the human predicament, human condition. And is all the more so in the case of those who are inclined to think and consider the pros and cons. You weigh the pros and cons. In contrast, in the same uh, play, there is a character called Laertes. He doesn't suffer from any of these perplexities. He is a, uh, a leader of an army and he marches straight through like an arrow shot from the bow. Now, he will never be in the predicament of Hamlet. At the same time, Laertes will not have the complexity, the aesthetic and thematic beauty of the character of Hamlet. You cannot write a great tragedy with Laertes, a great work of art, with Laertes as a central character. You need a Hamlet for it. But the disastrous consequences of Hamlet's indecision are portrayed in grim realities. When the play ends, the stage is littered with corpses, all because this man, the Prince of Denmark, could not make up his mind when he should have made up his mind and he should have resorted to decisive action, which he did not. I will not go into a host of textual details because that will burden this presentation unnecessarily. So keep that at the back of my mind. Now consider the other play, which is exactly the opposite. The central character of Macbeth, again, is a character called Macbeth. And he doesn't suffer from indecision, he suffers from another problem, namely, 
uh, unthinking action. Of course, it's not that Macbeth cannot think. I mean, after he kills Duncan, he gives himself to a series of soliloquies in which he is examining himself, what he has done, and the corrosive effect his guilt has on his uh, character, his soul, his inner felicity, and the devastation it brings about uh, in, in his relationship with his own wife, uh, Lady Macbeth. So, two extremes are presented. Now, if you read Aristotle's uh, book, Ethics, Ethics, which has had a long-standing, enduring influence on the European thinking on ethics, um, Aristotle's view is very, very similar to the view of uh, Lord Buddha, the golden mean. He says, if you really want to act virtuously, avoid the two extremes. Now, brought down to the specifics of the two texts that I cited, Put together, do not go to this. Go to, go to the extreme of philosophical uh, reflections, examining the pros and cons, and then you know wasting a whole lifetime over it. At the same time, do not go to the other extreme of acting decisively but without due thought. Both of which result in tragedy. Keep to the via media. Think and act. Give due consideration, but at the same time, act when you need to act. Because time is of the essence of things. Now, this is more or less the kind of rough picture. Uh, I'm not saying that I've done, done any justice to Shakespeare, the complexity with which Shakespeare treats these two characters and the human dilemmas that uh, Shakespeare presents to us. Now, why do I cite this uh, in the context of our examining whether or not uh, Rahul Gandhi should accept this uh, crown of thorns? You know, again, as uh, Shakespeare, uh, if I may borrow Shakespeare's unforgettable and inimic inimitable words, unhappy lies the crown, sorry, un unhappy lies the head that wears the crown. Unhappy lies the head that wears the crown. So, the burdens of responsibilities. At the same time, you prove your stature only when you accept responsibility and prove your mettle. How can you prove yourself if you don't put yourself in a position of responsibility and through your choices and actions, the beneficial consequences thereof, you prove to those around you that this is indeed who you really are. That is why, in a practical way, we say, do not judge a person in terms of what he says, but by what he, did, what he does. Do not judge a person by what he says, but by what he does. This is as true of Rahul Gandhi as it is of Narendra Modi. I am not saying this because I want to criticize Narendra Modi. By now at least you would have realized that I have absolutely no personal interest in criticizing somebody or praising somebody. But please understand realistically that a person who occupies a position of at most national importance will attract far greater criticism than a person who does not have a comparable position. For example, you cannot ask the opposition parties why it is that the situation in this country is like this and like this and like that. Like that. You can ask, uh, say, the leader of uh, uh, the Congress party uh, or the uh, uh, Tinamul Congress leader, whoever that may be, as to why it is that the, that, uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir, or now Jammu and Kashmir does not exist, where the, the valley is not settling down. That question has to be raised either with uh, Sri Amit Shah, who is the Home Minister of the country, or the Prime Minister who controls the entire government. So, when questions are asked to Sri Narendra Modi, it doesn't mean that the person who asks such questions is hostile to him. Unfortunately, in this country, there is this kind of very shallow thinking, absolutely stupid thinking. If you think like that, if you talk that, like that in public, you will legitimately attract derision, ridicule. Only stupid people talk like that. How can a person who is not handling the governance of this country answer for what is, whatever is going wrong in this country? 
those answers have to be provided by those who are at the helm of affairs and therefore those questions will always be raised with those who are at the helm of affairs. And that said, let's proceed further. So I said that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of um, practicing the golden mean, the Buddhist idea, the Greek uh, philosophical idea, uh, must apply uh, equally to Raji, uh, Rahul Gandhi and to uh, Narendra Modi. Uh, and uh, uh, now, with this kind of a background, let's look at Rahul in particular. What is his predicament at the moment? Now, the fact that he accepted the very challenging responsibility of being the president of the International Congress at a time when the party wasn't in the best of states. And the fact that he struggled and struggled and struggled against unimaginable odds. Carrying the burden of a party which is organizationally so weak, abysmally weak. Also, the burden of uh, colleagues, party members, who over a period of time got alienated from the ideological core of the party, the vision of the Indian National Congress, which goes back to the vision of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, and through the exposure to power, seats of power a long, a long period of time, got inwardly corrupted. I have no hesitation in saying this. For example, far too, many, far too many Congress leaders at the state level, district level, love themselves far more than they love the Congress party. Whereas my position is that every politician should love the country first, his party next and himself last. That's my position. You could say that this is too idealistic to be practical, but that's where I stand. And that's what I would have done if I had entered politics. And that's exactly what I did when I became the principal of St. Stephen's College. I always kept an eye of the, on the country. Then I kept an eye on my community because the Christian community needs to be educated and brought up to the mark in order to enable them to play a constructive role in nation building. No nation is served or benefited from a community that remains backward and goes still more backward. That's a problem with the Christian community in North India, which nobody understood. Nobody ever tried to understand why I did what I did. I could very well have enjoyed the perks of office and earned the applause of everyone and retired much, way richer than I, than I was, remained tremendously popular. I would have been greatly in demand, but I became instead the object of uh, opprobrium and obloquy simply because I had a sense of purpose and that sense of purpose did not cohere or agree with this. Uh, aims and objectives, vested interests, the ruling economic social elite in this country. Bad for me, good for them, or whatever you like. So, um, congressmen are remiss in this. And I hope they stage a comeback. I hope they experience a moral regeneration more than a political renaissance. There can be no political renaissance without a moral regeneration. That insight goes all the way back to Aristotle and Plato. And that insight I find very clearly marked in the political vision of Jesus Christ. The reason why I did a separate video on the politics of Jesus Christ. I hope you've seen that. And uh, put all these things together and get a clearer idea. So, now being, now coming specifically to Rahul Gandhi. It is not that he was reluctant to take on a position of responsibility. He did that. He did his very best fighting against all odds. And yes, he was rattled with uh, the 2019 uh, uh, general elections and against the supplication of every member of the party uh, in a seemingly impetuous manner, 
I wouldn't call it, and that's why I said seemingly impetuous manner. In my line of opinion, it's not impetuous. Uh, it, it was, it's an attempt to benchmark how accountable and responsible a man in a state of, uh, in a position of leadership needs to be. But having demitted office, he did not run away from the battle. He fought the battle, in fact, more eminently, efficiently, and symbolically than ever before. That's a tremendous thing. That's a tremendous thing. The present criticism of this disappointment with Rahul Gandhi of his reluctance to take on office of take on offices of responsibility would have been hundred percent justified if Rahul had limited office in 2019 and vanished into thin air. Yes, I could have understood that, but that's not what he did. Look at the turnaround that he brought about. Who in this country would debate? that Rahul is at least 90% responsible for the turnaround, the, the, the political regeneration of the Congress party. Not even the most ardent of Congress leaders expected that this time around the Congress party win as many as, would win as many as 99 seats going up from 50, 53. How did that happen? So it's not as so Rahul Gandhi demitted office and fled from the scene. No, he demitted office, stayed on to fight and has proved his mettle. Therefore, if he is at the moment taking time to decide whether or not he should be the LOP or for that matter, matter whether, whether he should stay on with Vainad or give up Vainad and stick to uh, uh, Amethi, uh, sorry, Rai Bareilly, Rai Bareilly. I always associate Rahul with uh, 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 Amethi. <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, uh, stick on with um, uh, Amethi. I'm sorry for this confusion. Uh, now, it cannot be that he is incapable of taking decisions or he's in, in, incapable of accepting uh, positions of responsibility and discharging his work with dedication and distinction. This, this I cannot accept anymore because five years ago I would have accepted it, right now I can't because I have a small sense of fairness about people, whether it is Rahul or Narendra Modi or anybody else, it's the same. I do not wish to be unfair to anyone under the sun for any reason whatsoever. Now, what could be his point of hesitation at this point in time? A couple of things. First of all, Rahul is today not merely the most dynamic leader of one particular party, the International Con Congress, but also an important member of a coalition where he realizes that he has to work with very senior people. And the reason why I did an earlier video detailing how Rahul conducted himself when he was a student in St. Stephen's College, where he showed excessive concern for the well-being of others, for the sentiments of others, for the dignity of others, was a good reason. The reason was, without my stating it in that video, was to provide a perspective through which to look at all that he does. You know, if I don't have any regard for the sentiments of others, if I don't uh, hold others in respect, if I don't want to treat others as I would like to be treated by them, what's called the ethical and emotional equivalence, if I don't respect this duty to behave in a manner that respects this principle of equivalence of worth and respect, then I can grab any position. In fact, I can conspire against others who are better than me and worse them because I'm a crook and grab positions and go about strutting on the stage of personal achievement and expect everybody to clap for me. I don't think Rahul is made of that metal at all. And if you think that's a flaw in him, then I have nothing to say about it. I mean, think of Rahul. He has to uh, 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 mind the fact that there is a Sharad power. I'm not saying that Sharad power, power is jockeying for uh, position. There is Mr. Karge. 
there is uh, Mamta Banerjee who's seen it to him, and it was a very good claim. There are several others. And imagine this 50-year-old man suddenly positioning himself as leader of the opposition simply because he wants to give the impression that he's decisive like Modi is, that he's a milder version of Srinathendra Modi. That would be terribly, terribly disappointing. So I see here an important factor at play, namely that Rahul's native personal culture of keeping a very wide margin of consideration for others, number one. Number two, uh, at this point in time, if you look at the impact that Rahul has had on his party, the maximum impact that Rahul has had is clearly on account of the two yatras, the Bharat Jodo Yatra, and the Nyaya Yatra. Now, my dear friends, in the Indian context, the metaphor of Yatra is a very powerful one. It's a resonant symbol. What does Yatra mean? Yatra means mobility. Yatra means outreach. Yatra means being in touch with people, being in contact with people, and lending a, a, an ear to what they have to say. Yatra is a symbolic opposite of the kursi, a position, an office of importance or profit or whatever. So this young man, who is personally deeply committed to the vitality of his party, to the task of regenerating his party, so that there is something like a meaningful opposition to ensure the health and wholeness of, the, of Indian democracy, Knowing that the metaphor or spiritual uh, symbolism of movement, Yatra, has had a beautiful effect in terms of re-energizing his cadres, as well as creating a never widening ripple of positivity in the country. The reason why many neutral vote voters this time around got attracted to the Congress party. Perhaps he must be mulling in his mind that the best he can still do for the country, for his party and even for the India coalition is to still remain in that state, if possible, if circumstances so permit, so that he is not uh, benignly imprisoned, if you like, or prestigiously imprisoned in a chair which will seriously limit him. Now, for example, why was it that Priyanka Gandhi, who has done enormous work in the state of UP, the all-important state of UP, which is the microcosm of India, political microcosm of, uh, of India, why, why is it that she didn't fight? She could easily have fought from uh, any constituency of a choice. And I don't discredit or disbelieve what Rahul said. Had Priyanka fought against Narendra Modi from Varanasi, very likely she would have won. I don't rule out that possibility at all. But she chose not to because she said, and that's clearly what she stated, and stated well before the results became available, when she came under pressure to, uh, to fight. She said, no, I would rather be available to canvas and help all other candidates, including those of the India Alliance, if they need my help. So one has to make a very crucial, painful, personal choice. Should I occupy this position and get stuck there? Or should I be on the move, spreading the positive influence as far and wide as possible, to the best of my ability, and to the best of the limited resources that they uh, uh, resources available to my party, whose funds have been frozen, whose leaders have been demoralized with, uh, you know, the ED action, ED effect, ED effect, so on and so forth. So therefore, that consideration cannot be ruled out. Now, end of the day, I am inclined to believe that Rahul Gandhi will do what 
he believes is best for the country. People may say whatever they like about Indira Gandhi. I was never an admirer of Indira Gandhi. But one thing I know about her, and that is, she loved India above her own party. Whenever congressmen went to her with a proposal that would have advantaged the party at the state levels, she always reprimanded them and said, India first, party second. This no one, no one can take away from her. And Raj, Rahul Gandhi belongs to that tradition. And his father, his mother, his parents both belong to that tradition. That is why you see that personal ambition is at its lowest in this family. Yes, they are willing to serve, they are willing to give all they have to serving the country. Now here, pardon me, I have to introduce something of a personal experience. In the run-up to 2019 election, when there was a rumor, there was a rumor in Delhi, and that, that rumor reached me, uh, I'm sorry, this is not uh, 2019, it's 2014. Uh, pardon me for this confusion. Because I didn't mean to include this uh, reference in this uh, video. It was uh, the run-up to the elections 2014. The, several people came and told me that the life of Sonia Gandhi is in serious peril. And therefore, if she moves around campaigning as her husband did, and you know what happened on account of that, it's very difficult to ensure the personal security of a leader who goes around without due protection, mixes uh, with people freely. Uh, even the best of uh, uh, you know, security staff cannot ensure personal safety. So people who really loved and cared for her began to express their concern that she could be in serious danger. So soon after hearing, uh, soon after this coming into bias, I had to meet her in some context. And I asked her this question. I said, are you aware that uh, there is this talk in the town? She said, yes, I'm aware of it. Then I asked him, doesn't it scare you? She said, yes, I'm a human being. I'm not beyond fear. So I said, so? So, she said, I'll do what I have to do because, and this is exactly what she told me, a leader who cannot cope with his or her fear is not fit to be a leader. This is exactly what she told me. In other words, like her mother-in-law, Ms. Indira Gandhi, Indira Priyadarshini, this lady who is always damned and vilified as an Italian, the fact that she's an Indian citizen doesn't mean anything to anyone. The fact that she loves India in the fullness of her heart doesn't mean a thing to uh, her detractors. She was willing to risk her life in order to discharge her duties by her party. That is character. That is character. So that is the personal heritage, that's a tradition, that's a family uh, culture. And a person coming from that kind of a background should not be expected to jockey for power and position. It may not be that he is scared of taking on some responsibility, assuming that he does not have the ability to do justice to it. I don't think Rahul Gandhi has to do anything more to prove his abilities than, he has, than what he has already done. Not at all. I for one wouldn't believe it. So it is not inefficiency. And at this point in time, I don't even think that it is Hamlet-like Hamlet indecision. Rather, it is a sense of propriety based on an unerring sense of courtesy, respect for elders, respect for the hopes and aspirations, the sentiments of others, and also considering as to what exactly is it that he can do best for his party and the country, 
which nobody else can. I'm a leader of opposition. There are many people who can actually do it. But doing what he did through the Bharat Jodo Yatra, Nyaya Yatra, etc. is something that nobody else can do. Nobody else can do it. So should he do what he alone can do or should he do something that many others can do, whether it be in the Congress Party or in the wider alliance of India? That may be the question that's bothering him now. But I don't think the state of indecision will last soon. Uh, the day is not far off and we'll have this uh, uncertainty or ambiguity result. Whatever be it, I want to once again restate and emphasize my faith in the goodness of this young man. And I thank God that at this crucial juncture in the continuing evolution of this great nation, there is a Rahul Gandhi. And may his goodness flow like a river of peace and justice and embrace the whole of the Indian subcontinent. Jai Hind, Bharat Mata Ki Jai, Jai Sri Ram. Sri Ram as the embodiment of righteousness. Righteousness. May righteousness fill every particle of the body politic of India. Righteousness. Inspired sense of justice. That's what righteousness is. Inspired sense. Godly sense of justice. Not man's sense of justice. God's sense of justice is righteousness. That's what is supposedly embodied in Lord, uh, uh, Lord Ram. Therefore, as a Christian, an ardent follower of Jesus Christ, I have absolutely no hesitation in saying, Jai Shri Ram. All these inhibitions are politically created and slapped on us so that through this kind of reciprocal, uh, you know, what is that, uh, communalism, majoritarian communalism can be given a new lease of life. Communalism of every kind is an insult to the genius of India. And no person in a census should lend any support or supply oxygen to this deadly disease which is also an unbearable insult. So, thank you. Uh, I wait to hear from you as to what you think about this very, very core issue about which all of us are eager and anxious. Thank you. Have a great day.